Good morning. Please stand for a first song. Father, we just thank you for this, this morning that you've given us as we come to praise our Savior who lives. And it is because he lives uh, that we have the opportunity to come and open up our hearts to praise and worship him. And it's because he lives, we live. And that's what we come to worship. That for our sake he made him be sin and he knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And those who become righteous.
righteous and who clothe themselves with the righteousness of Christ not only live, but live throughout all eternity in your kingdom. Father, we're just thankful and grateful for that. We pray that there's one here who doesn't know that, who doesn't have that kind of saving faith to know that, that even though one day they will die, they will be raised from the dead and called called forth by your son. We pray that their hearts are open to hear your word this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good to see everybody this morning. Just a couple quick things. We'll get right back to our worship service. Just a reminder, Sunday school at 9.30, we've got one for all ages. Uh, adult Sunday school, youth Sunday school, children Sunday school, all at 9.30 um, every Sunday. So we encourage everybody to participate um, in each one of those. Our Bible study, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Um, the kids, um, back over the last couple of weeks, the kids, the older kids now have class on Wednesdays. Uh, and then we have nursery for the, for the little ones. So again, thankful for all those who, who not only lead and teach the kids, but those who... Um, stay in the nursery with the little ones. That way the, the parents can enjoy a few minutes to sit down and, and, and hear the word of God. So I'm thankful for everybody who, who helps in that manner. While well, game feed, upon us, be, behold, right? This doesn't mean behold, it's tomorrow um, at 7 o'clock. So I think we got everything. Um, there's still a, a list back there. Um, if you're going to bring something, please put it on the list. That way we have an idea uh, at the at, by today. Who's bringing what? Uh, that way, if, if, if a couple of us need to bring a couple extra things, just to make sure there, there's going to be enough food. We we anticipate that this place is going to be packed uh, tomorrow night, so we're going to need a lot of food to, to feed a lot of people. So if you plan on bringing something, please please put it on that list um, so so we'll know. And then if you have time after service today, we're going to get everything out of here and get it set up. So if you have a few minutes after service, please please stay back, um, help us get ready uh, for tomorrow. And then this coming Saturday at um, 8 o'clock, or not 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock, so if you'll be there, none of the girls will be there. My wife will be in bed at 8 o'clock. Um, 9 o'clock, right? Is it 9 o'clock? 9 o'clock at the kitchen table. Um, all the women, not only the women in the church, if you know any other women that you want to bring um, with you in the community, it's, um, it's a time of, of, of fellowship with, with all the ladies. So kitchen table for the breakfast buffet this coming Saturday, 9 o'clock. Um, all, the, all the ladies will be down there. Um, fellowship lunch coming up in a couple weeks. So there's another list back there. We got one for the wild game feed for tomorrow and then our fellowship lunch coming up after we have communion in a couple weeks that first Sunday in February. Um, what is Shelly? Is it soup? Soup and chili? Is that soup and chili is the is the, the list uh, with some other things uh, back there. So um, find that list back there and uh, mark your name where you'd like for that. Um, to the word. Um, I'll defer uh, to Shayla on most of this information. Uh, the idea here is that every year as Christians, we should read uh, through the Bible. The more that we put God's word into our heart, and the more, the more firmly that it's planted there. So there's, um, Shayla's gonna print out some Bible plans for anybody who wants it, but this up here is specifically for uh, the women. So it's only every other month. So if you read through the Bible in one year, it's only only six times um, that they're asking. So on. For this particular Saturday, February the 11th, if you're doing that Bible reading plan with all the other um, ladies, it's on that day you would gather together down at the high for a cup of coffee. You'd read those passages that are due that day together. Um, this is a time for fellowship, and this is a good thing, because if you've ever tried to read through the Bible in a year, by the time you get to February or March, you get bogged down, uh, you start to get a couple weeks behind, and then you just give up. It's happened, it's happened to me before, it happens to, to all of us. Um, but if you have a group of people that can encourage you and keep you accountable, uh, this is a good thing. It keeps you accountable to get through the Bible um, in a year. So if you need any more, more information, um, uh, get with Shayla. And that's all we got. Let's get back to work. <laughs>
page 335. <coughs> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. Chapter 8 this morning. We're going to look at a couple other things before we get there, so keep your hands at the ready. So, as Jesus now is continuing his preaching ministry, Luke transitions us the same way he did back in chapter 4. In chapter 4, Jesus proclaimed himself as the Messiah in the synagogue at Nazareth. He cast out demons, he heals Peter's mother-in-law as well as many others, and then it was time for him to part to do the same things in all the other towns. And we see that at the end of chapter 4 in verses 42 through 44. 
When it was day, he departed and went into the desolate place. So the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Jesus says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. I was sent for this purpose. I must. It means necessary. He has to. It was a matter of necessity that he goes and preaches the good news of the kingdom of God. We see the woman at the end of chapter 7. She was the latest recipient of that good news of God's kingdom. It was a kingdom that included her. She was an immoral woman whose sins were many. And by all indications, she was a prostitute. Yet the good news of the kingdom of God was for her. The Pharisees could not understand that. Their hearts had been so hardened that they lost the capacity to rejoice for a sinner who has come to repentance because in their minds, this woman was beyond redeemable. But before she got up and left that house, she is the one who left justified. Just as the tax collector and the Pharisee that we read in chapter 18, when Jesus tells his little story, the tax collector and the Pharisee, he go to the temple to pray. The tax collector, whose sins were also many, came in great humility and asked for forgiveness. And Jesus tells us he is the one who went home justified. The good news of God's kingdom is that there is no sin that you've committed that God cannot forgive. There is no pit that God cannot pull you out of. As far as the Jews were concerned, the tax collector was about the lowest scum on the earth that you could become, unless maybe perhaps you were a prostitute. Those two were at the bottom of the barrel together, yet those two are the ones who go home justified. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we kind of get a picture of that as Paul writes to the church in Corinth. Many liberal churches, they tear chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians out of the Bible because it speaks of unrighteous people who are not going to enter the kingdom of God. And liberal Christianity has no room for people who can't enter God's kingdom. But that's what Paul tells us in verse 9 in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Because what Paul is getting ready to say contradicts everything that the world tells you today on every commercial and TV channel and news channel and everything else in between. Don't be deceived because there are unrighteous people who are not going to go into God's kingdom. And then he gives us a list. This isn't a comprehensive list. This is just a small list that many things can fall under. But as I say, listen for your name to be called in this list and make sure that you're not still there. Neither the sexually immoral, well, we already had that in the prostitute at chapter 7. She was sexually immoral. She was unrighteous. She was not going to enter God's kingdom. Nor idolaters. That's right. Nobody has golden calves on their shelves at home, I'm sure. But an idolatry is just anything that you put ahead of God. Nor adulterers. Again, there's the woman in chapter 7. And her sexual immorality is a prostitute. She would have committed adultery with many people nor men who practice homosexuality. Many people like to believe that that is not in the Bible. It's in God's word. It's in black and white. Homosexuality is a sin. It's always been a sin. It always will be a sin. Those who practice it are unrighteous, and they will not enter God's kingdom unless they repent. Nor thieves, nor the greedy. There's the tax collector in chapter 18. Greedy, drunkard, revilers, swindlers. Again, the tax collector. So both the tax collector and the woman in chapter 7 are both in this list. Paul says they will not inherit the kingdom of God, as were such some of you. As Paul writes to the church in Corinth, 
many people, names, were called out in that list. However, verse 11 waters up some of you. All of those things must be past tense. It doesn't mean if you were ever one of those things or if you are currently one of those things that you will remain unrighteous, but you must repent and those things must become past tense in your life. Because that's what happened with the woman in chapter 7. That's what happened to the tax collector that Jesus talks about. In chapter 18, they repented of their sins and gave their lives to Christ. Because look what Paul says that further in verse 11. You were that, but you have been washed. Christ has washed you clean. You have been sanctified. It means he has made you holy. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Justification means to be made righteous. So Paul says the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, and he gives a list of what unrighteousness looks like. But if you've been washed clean and been made holy and been made righteous by Christ, you will then enter the kingdom of God. The unrighteous will not enter but if you have been justified by Christ, it means he has made you righteous. Therefore, you will enter the kingdom of God. And we saw that in chapter 7 that we covered last week. An immoral woman who was a prostitute who came and fell at the feet of Jesus. And there in verse chapter 7 of Luke, verse 50, he says, your faith has saved you. Right before that, he told her, your sins, and I know there are many, are forgiven. Because she became one of those people Paul talked about as were, such some of you, past tense, in a matter of seconds. She was unrighteous. She repented. Christ made her righteous. The good news of the kingdom of God is for everyone However, not everyone who hears it will respond to it. The prostitute did, the Pharisee didn't. And Jesus now demonstrates how that happens in the parable of the sower. In Luke chapter 8, we'll look at verses 1 through 15. Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their own means. When a great crowd was gathering and people from the town went, came after him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell on the path that was trampled underfoot, the birds of the air devoured it, and some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. Some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and it choked it. Some fell into good soil, and it grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. When his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others, they're in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path who have heard, the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but they have no root. They believe for a while, and then come the time of testing, they fall away. And as for those who fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that is on the good soil, they are those who hear. Hearing the word, they hold fast to it in an honest and good heart, and they bear fruit with patience. So in verses 1 through 3, he goes from village to village proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Some of the women who have been healed by evil spirits. And then he gives us there in verses 2 and 3 the names of some of these women. So before Luke moves to the parable, he takes time to introduce us to some of the women who are followers of Jesus. So he just told us of this event that took place in chapter 7, which involved a woman who, a very simple woman, who was redeemed by Christ. 
So this is now a natural spot for Luke to introduce us to some of the other women in Jesus' company. First, it tells us that there were many women who were part of this larger group of Jesus' disciples, which was out of the ordinary. Jewish women were not allowed to learn the Torah in the synagogue. They were not allowed to follow the rabbis and to be taught anything. But we see that's not the case with Jesus. His attitude towards women was quite different from the attitude of the other rabbis of the day. He came to seek and to save the lost, and that means both men and women. The second thing we're told here is that these women who followed him were essential to his ministry, just like the women of the church today. They provided in their own means, means they provided some of the financial means that was necessary to support Jesus' ministry. And they were given the names of three of them. But we're told that there were many others. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna. Mary Magdalene, we're told, was a woman whom Jesus cast out seven demons. Unfortunately, history has connected her with the prostitute of chapter 7, even though there's zero evidence of that whatsoever. Every movie has always portrayed her as a prostitute, which is incorrect. Scripture never calls her that. It only says that she was healed of seven demons before she became a follower of Jesus. And why shouldn't these women's names be written down in God's word? We know that God's word is going to last forever. If we look over in Luke 23, and why shouldn't their names be written down for all eternity? Because we're told of their faithfulness. In chapter 23, they're at the crucifixion. In verse 49, so Jesus is now hanging on the cross, and it says all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. All the guys have bailed out already. We only know of John as the only disciple, at least of the 12, who stuck around for the crucifixion. Everybody else has gone hiding because unless they become the fourth guy hanging next to Jesus. But the women didn't go anywhere. They stood there and watched their Lord be crucified. Down in verses 55 and 56. So after Jesus died on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea asked to have Jesus' body so that he might be buried in his tomb. Picking up in 55, the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, and they returned and prepared spices and ointments. So after the crucifixion, they never let Jesus' body out of their sight. They followed Joseph as he took Jesus' body, and they went to see where he was going to be laid. And then they went home and prepared spices. When the sun went down, that's when the Sabbath started. And the Sabbath didn't end until Saturday night when the sun went down. It was too dark, so the women had to wait until Sunday morning to go prepare the body. That's where we come in chapter 24 on the third day. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb. Whose day? The women. That's who it's talking about. They took the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened, they bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember, he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all the things to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Why shouldn't their names be written down? They never left Jesus' side at his crucifixion. They followed to see where his body was buried. They were the first ones there on Sunday morning to prepare his body. So it's no wonder that the Lord appeared to them 
first because of their faithfulness as his disciples. They were there for the crucifixion, they were there for the burial, and they were there for the resurrection. Soon afterwards then, in Luke 8, we're told Jesus went through the cities proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. In the ESV it says proclaiming and bringing. Which I don't care for that translation. It should be proclaiming and preaching. Those are the two words there. And they're synonymous with one another. They both mean to preach. So to proclaim, that Greek word keruso, it means to announce, to tell, to preach, to persuade, to urge people to comply. So when Jesus is preaching, he is urging them and persuading them to comply to what he's saying. And to preach. Uangelizo. That's the verb of the noun, uangelion, which is where we get the English word evangelism. So evangelism it means to preach the gospel. And that's what Jesus wanted to go do. The good news we have seen is that he preaches a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. A message of forgiveness, it's a message of salvation for anyone who believes. It's a message, that, a message that brings peace, as we saw there at the end of chapter 7. We're saved by grace through faith. And it's only then that we can have that peace that Jesus told that woman to go in. You cannot go in peace until you've been saved by grace. So even though this message of the kingdom of God is for everyone, it is preached to, to everyone who hears. We see that not everyone who hears it believes it. So why is that? Well, Jesus gives a parable explaining. Verses 4 through 8, he gives the parable. When a great crowd was gathering, people from town came to him, said in the parable, a sower went to sow. His seed he sowed some along the path that was trampled underfoot. Birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, and it choked it out. Some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So as Jesus is preaching, he now gives a parable, in which he did many times. It's just an illustration in order to get the point across of what he's trying to say. So as he's throwing some seed out. It says a man went to sow. So we think of a farmer going out to the field to plant a crop. He takes the seed with him. As he was throwing some of it, it falls on the side of the road and it got trampled on underfoot. And the birds came and ate it. We see that for some, they only show contempt for God's word when they hear it. They don't want anything to do with it. As far as they're concerned, they just trample on it under their feet. Well, the writer of Hebrews gives a warning to people who do that in Hebrews chapter 10. We find first the pastoral epistles, first, second Timothy, Titus. And then Philemon. After that, you'll find Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 to 31. Hebrews 10, 26. For if we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So for those who hear God's word and just cast it out, it's no good to them. They've heard it, that they need to repent of their sins, lest they face the wrath and judgment of God. Yet it's no good for them. Instead, they continue to go on sinning deliberately. The writer of Hebrews says, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So if Jesus' sacrifice wasn't good enough for them, the writer of Hebrews says, well, I'm sorry to tell you, but there is no other sacrifice that's going to work. So if you've cast Christ and him aside, then there is no more sacrifice for your sins. And then in verse 27, the result of it, 
So all you have now is a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. In verse 28, he then gives an example from the Old Testament. One who set aside the law of Moses died without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. So he gives the example from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, under the law of Moses, there were certain things that were punishable by death. They carried capital punishment. For instance, adultery. If you were caught in the act of adultery by two or more witnesses, you were taken outside the city gates and you were stoned to death without mercy. They showed no mercy because God has given a commandment of not to do this. So if people spit in the face of God and then do that, then they were executed without mercy because they broke God's commandment. So in verse 29, how much worse punishment now do you think will be deserved for the one who trampled underfoot the Son of God? So if in the law, if you were caught in adultery and you were killed without mercy, how much more punishment do you think you're going to deserve for trampling under your foot God's Son who has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified and outraged the Spirit of grace? Because when you disregard God's Son, you disregard His atonement. In verse 30, he gives, he quotes a couple of scriptures because he's saying, we know already in scripture, God has said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and he will judge his people. So you can have that expectation. And in verse 31, it terrifies me, and I know that I'm saved. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God for those who trample underfoot God's word and trample underfoot his son. How much more punishment do you think that person is going to get when they stand before God in their sin for rejecting him and rejecting his gospel and rejecting his son that he sent? The warning is for those who hear God's word and then trample it on under their feet. How fearful it is for them to fall into the hands of a living God. Some of the other seed fell on rocky soil because it had no moisture, it cannot take root, so it withers away. Others fall on thorns, and as it grows, it's overcome by the thorns and gets choked out. Yet some fall on good soil, and it grows and produces a crop that's a hundredfold. And Jesus says, he who has ears, let him hear. Or else, if you have ears, listen. Here it emphasizes the importance of hearing and responding to the gospel. If you can hear it, he says, pay attention to it. If you hear it, then respond to it. If you hear it, then believe it. But why do so many people hear and do not respond and believe? Well, Jesus now gives the interpretation of the parable in 9 through 15. His disciples asked him what the parable meant. He said, to you it's been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they're in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. The parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The words along the path, the ones along the path are those who have heard from, heard, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. So that they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who hear the word, receive it with joy, but have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. And as for those among the thorns, as those who hear, but as they go along their way, they're choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, those who hear, hearing the word, they hold fast to it in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. So the disciples asked Jesus for an interpretation. He says, to you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God or the mysteries of the kingdom. In our vernacular, when we hear the word mystery, we hear something that's it's unsolvable. We have to find all the facts and the clues, but that's not the original meaning of this word. It means something that was unknown, but it has now been made known. It was something that was hidden, but it's no longer hidden. That's what he's saying. The kingdom of God was hidden, but it's no longer hidden from you, for I have opened your eyes to see it. 
the secrets of the kingdom of God, they cannot be discovered by man. They can only be revealed to him by God. They're revealed to those who have been saved by grace through faith because now they have eyes to see and they have ears to hear. And they listen and they respond to the gospel. But for others, they can't find the meaning. They have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear because the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. It makes no sense to them whatsoever. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus makes no sense and it means nothing to them. It's nonsense. And it's terrifying for them who fall into the hands of the living God because they've trampled underfoot the Son of God. Jesus says the parable is this, the seed is the word of God and all these other different soils represent the people who hear it and either respond or don't. First, those on the side of the road when the seed is trampled underfoot and the birds of the air come to eat it, Jesus says these birds represent the devil. That as soon as they hear the word of God, the devil comes and snatches it away. He takes the word, the word away from their hearts so they will not believe and they will not be saved. We see that Satan is active in this world. He is like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Satan has come to seek the lost from being saved. Both Jesus and Satan are seeking after the same people, but for different reasons. That's why he's called the Antichrist. He comes looking like Christ, but he came to do the exact opposite of what Christ came to do. Both Jesus and Satan are seeking after the lost. Jesus is seeking so he might save them. Satan is seeking them so they might not be saved. He wants to get in the way of that salvation, and he'll do anything in his power to take God's word away from you. He will do whatever it takes to keep you out of church. That's step number one. Sunday mornings are always the worst. Every other day of the week, it seems going normal. Sunday mornings are always the worst. You always wake up late, you toss and turn on ice, and you're tired, you always have a headache when you get up, your stomach's not feeling well. Husband bickering at his wife, the wife bickering at her husband, kids are being knuckleheads, nobody will get out of the bathroom, so when you get ready, I can't find my shoes, time's running out. I just That's what my house looks like every Sunday. That, that's not a hyperbole, that's not a parable. This is what goes on in my house every single Sunday morning. Every other day of the week, we wake up earlier than we do every other day and everything goes smoothly, but on Sunday mornings, it never goes smooth. And there's a reason for that, that Satan can get in before you can get to church and he can get his foothold in the church. He's not omnipresent. He can only be one place at a time, but there are other fallen angels that have come with him, all the demons and devils that are with him. They're always there to snatch the word of God out of your heart. And if they can keep you from going to church, then they've won already. They just moved to the next house. Have you ever noticed that as all this chaos is going on on Sunday morning, once you decide that forget it, we're just not even going to go, all the chaos seems to dissipate and everything goes back to normal. Because they've won, they just move on to the next house. You've heard it said, they said, Sunday morning church is always a Saturday night decision. If you're not already planning to go to church on Saturday night, that you're going to get your Bible ready, your clothes are set aside, you're going to go to sleep at a decent time so that you're wake up ready. If you decide, are we going to church tomorrow? I don't know. We'll see how we feel tomorrow morning. That always gives another reason to make it easier not to go. I'm speaking from experience. I've not always been a pastor. I used to be the one in the pew. Many a morning, we'll decide tomorrow morning whether or not we're going to go to church. And when you wait till Sunday morning to decide whether you're not going to go, more often than not, it's just easier just to not go. Paul tells us in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. 
So if faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ, the number one in Satan's playbook is just to keep you from going and hearing the word of Christ. Because if you don't hear it, then you can't come to faith. And if you don't have faith, you can't be saved. Checkmate. He just moves on to the next place. Those are those who hear the word and trample it under their feet. And they give it to Satan to steal away from them. The second, those on rocky soil, they hear the word, they receive it, and they believe it. And they do it with joy. They hear the gospel, it sounds good. They've been searching and looking for something, and they finally found it. It sounds believable. And they receive it with joy. They believe, excuse me, for a little while, but then they fall away. This is not speaking of salvation. Many use this verse of saying this is how people lose their salvation. It's not speaking of salvation. Believing and being saved are two different things. Satan believes the Bible. James tells us that. He was there in the beginning. He was in heaven. He's the one who took Jesus out in the desert for 40 days to tempt him. Satan believes what the Bible says. He just doesn't submit himself to it. It's intellectual belief. So these people, they believe it for a while, but they go away. It does not take root. It's not firmly planted. They don't take the time necessary to develop. So after they leave, after a time of testing, they fall away. In Mark chapter 4, when Mark gives his version of the parable of the sower, for those who fall on the rocky soil, he says, when persecution and tribulation arise, on the account of the word, immediately they fall away. Jesus says, immediately. When they come into temptation or persecution, that's Mark 4. Testing and temptation lead them away. At the first moment of persecution, they bell off. They take off quick. And in this day and age, that won't take long at all. Because if you left here this morning, and you wouldn't told all your friends and family, and you wouldn't announce to the world, that you just came home from church and you heard the good news of Jesus Christ and you have believed it, you have received it with great joy, they'll eat you alive in a matter of minutes. So you're telling me you receive hatred and bigotry with great joy because that's what people think of Christianity. You've now become one of those intolerant religious types, have you? All of a sudden you're the expert to tell people on how they can and can't live their lives. So this God of love of yours, who can tell others who they can and can't love, this is what you receive with great joy. Once that persecution begins, those people immediately fall away. They say, forget this stuff. I'll just go back to where I was before, where I was comfortable. Nobody bothered me. Everybody liked me. So they fall away. The third seed fell among the thorns. They hear the word, but the cares of this world and the riches and pleasures consume them. Therefore, it does not mature and bear fruit. They hear it, but they just cannot overcome the cares of the world. They're too consumed. They do not persevere to the end. When they begin to weigh things like biblical purity, holiness, sanctification, living a life that looks like Christ each and every day, when they hear words like sacrifice, discipline, overcoming, and persevering, and then they weigh that against things like eat, drink, and be merry, go live your best life now, get as much pleasure and satisfaction as you can while you can, well, the latter sounds a lot better than the formal. In a life of purity and sanctification, it sounds good, but the other sounds a lot better. And they get caught up in the riches and cares of the world. For if we go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins. Hebrews tells us a terrifying thought that's terrifying to fall into the hands of a living God. And that's why the latter doesn't sound better to those who have been saved by faith. The fourth falls on good soil. They hear the word and they hold on to it. They grasp a hold of it, and they're not going to let it go. They persevere to the end, and they bear much fruit, a hundred times over, Jesus says. 
it's great that many people hear the word of God, but it's what a person does with that word that matters. So now that you have it, what are you going to do with it? Don't let other people and don't let persecution dictate how and what you believe because it's your eternal destiny that you're dealing with, not theirs. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So let the unrighteous not inherit it. Don't, them, don't let them convince you to come along on the ride with them. No, you must be washed clean. You must be sanctified. You must be justified by the Lord Jesus Christ. Beware of the dangers of the riches and pleasures of the world because they can pull you right back down into the pit that you were in before. And if you believe, Jesus says, you have not believed in vain, perseverance produces fruit, the fruit of the gospel. Many people mistake hearing and believing for salvation and faith. That's what we're always trying to get past. They're not one and the same. Remember, Satan hears and believes, but he does not have faith and he is not saved. Those who are saved persevere to the end. You will know them by their fruit. A true believer will produce fruit. They will endure. They will hold on to the word of God and they will not let anyone wrestle it away from them. We're told here in this parable that Satan will attempt to steal the word from you. The world will attempt to steal the word from you. We're even told that your wants and desires will attempt to steal the word from you. You will attempt to steal the word from you because that's our sinful nature is to always fall back into where we were before. We will attempt to take God's word and steal it from ourselves and go right back to where we were because that's our comfort zone. Don't let outside pressures and persecutions influence your decision to repent and believe the gospel and say to hear it, receive it with joy, believe it, hold on to it till the end. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He's kept it. He's persevered all the way until they remove his head from his shoulder. You must keep the faith. You must persevere to the end. That's the evidence of your salvation, perseverance through persecution. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word that you've given us for this parable that we see that many people hear but we see that most don't believe there's many different soils and only few hear it and believe it and hold on to it many other people trample upon it disregard it or just fall back into the same practices they were before. We pray for each one of us here to hold fast to your word, to persevere to the end, to overcome a world who continually tries to shut us out for what we believe in. We pray that if there's anyone here who's never repented and come to faith, that today is the day of their salvation. Today is the day that they will be born again into your kingdom that they go from unrighteous and not entering to becoming washed, to become sanctified, become justified, and become one of your children who will now spend their eternity in your kingdom. Father, we praise, honor, and glorify your name. For it's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Jesus speaks in parables many times in order to get his point across. And we see in this point, even if you take it by statistics, which I'm not sure if that's what Jesus' point was, but if we do, just from our own human standpoint, one in four people who continually hear the gospel, accept it and receive it, 75% cast it away. And if we just look at statistically how many people are Christians in the world today, it's much less than 25%, I can tell you that. We are the minority each and every day with the new things that continually get Past. Liberalism has overcome not only the world, it's overcoming many of our churches to continue to cave in 
in order to not upset anyone else. But we're told here to persevere to the end, whatever that looks like. And we have many people of that as examples. Jesus is the example. He went to the cross to persevere, to save us. Paul executed, all the disciples executed, many of the early Christians in the late first century all went to their deaths because they would not renounce their faith in Christ. They persevered to the end. We pray that God continues to give us that same perseverance to live in a world who wants to close our doors because we say the things that we say, what the Bible says, against human sexuality and many other things that are so acceptable in our communities and in our societies today. If you have any questions about salvation, baptism, anything else, love to meet with you after church. Um, remember, right after worship, we're going to um, get everything prepared for tomorrow night. We'll see everybody then tomorrow night at 7 o'clock as we enjoy that feast, yeah, Wednesday yeah. at uh, Bible study, uh, and then again next week for Sunday school and worship. So everybody, please stand. We're going to worship through song one last time.